In my last video, we saw that my biological age, as indicated by Morgan Levine's phenotypic age calculator, was about 13 years younger than my chronological age. But there's room for improvement, including my glucose levels, which were 95 milligrams per deciliter on this test. Now that's going in the wrong direction as shown here. So this is 30 data for 30 blood tests over the past six years. And we can clearly see that the trend for glucose for me is increasing during that time span. So how do we know that that's going in the wrong direction? So for that, let's have a look at the published, published literature. So this is a study of about 12 and a half million subjects. And uh, it's, we've got fasting glucose plotted on the y-axis against age on the x-axis. And for both men in green and women in red, when starting in youth with uh, glucose levels of about 85 milligrams per deciliter, we can see clearly for both men and women that glucose levels increase during aging. And I've arrowed the green to show where I should expect to be based on my chronological age, which isn't too far from that 95 that I just had on this blood test. Now, it isn't just that glucose increases during aging. It's also relatively higher levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So this is that data here with the hazard ratio for all-cause mortality on the y-axis plotted against the fasting level of serum glucose on the x. And we can see that the lowest risk for all-cause mortality is when glucose is 80 to 94 milligrams per deciliter. And then above that, uh, that value, so uh, 95 and higher, we see a, a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk and also less than 80 an increased all-cause mortality risk. So when considering that I'm now at 95 for glucose, I'm trending towards the, the wrong way in terms of all-cause mortality risk as it relates to glucose levels. Now I've had values within the last six years of about 85. So the goal is to get back to that. So the focus of this video is gonna involve my attempt to further improve biological age and in part by reducing glucose. And it's important to mention that the plan is to not mess up by other biomarkers. So let's go through that story. So with that in mind, uh, with the goal of reducing glucose but not making other biomarkers worse, worse, which dietary variables are correlated with higher glucose? So of all the macronutrients, so fat, protein, carbohydrate, and fiber, the macronutrient that is most strongly correlated with my fasting levels of glucose over the past six years in 30 blood tests is my average daily fat intake as shown here. So we can see a moderate correlation with a correlation coefficient of 0.67 and a highly significant p-value. And this suggests that a higher daily fat, a higher average daily fat intake is significantly correlated with higher glucose. Now, fat is not all comprised of the same types of fat. Fat is comprised of monounsaturated fats, MUFA, polyunsaturated fats, including omega-3, O3, and omega-6, O6, and or saturated fat. And I left out trans fats. The only source that of trans fats in my diet comes from cheese. And we'll see in, in a minute that cheese is not involved, significantly involved in this story. So first, the correlation for monounsaturated fat intake, the average monounsaturated fat intake, MUFA, with my fasting glucose over the past six years. 30, again, 30 blood tests. And all the trend line looks like it's going up. Uh, that correlation is not statistically significant. Similarly, uh, correlations for my average daily omega-3 intake and my average daily omega-6 intake are not significantly correlated with blood glucose. So what about saturated fat intake and its correlation with blood glucose levels? So now we see an almost identical plot uh, and a significant correlation. So the higher my average daily intake of saturated fat, the higher the glucose levels are. And again, you can see that it's statistically significant. And when again, when comparing these two plots, they're virtually identical. One could argue that saturated fat, my average daily saturated fat intake may be driving this correlation between total fat intake on fasting glucose. Now, for more specificity, saturated fat from which foods? And if I know that there are certain foods that can impact uh, this story, then it's just a simple measure of taking them out or reducing them. Now, I've tracked my daily food intake since uh, July of 2018, uh, 2018, and it's important to know I've been tracking macro and micronutrients since 2015, but it wasn't until 2018 that I decided to actually start tracking food, which is a less reductionist approach for tracking overall dietary composition. And I have 17 blood tests during that period, and we'll see why that's important in just a second. So during that period from July 2018 to September 1st, which is the day before my latest blood test on September 2nd, a couple weeks ago, we can see my average daily saturated fat intake is about 36 grams per day. And then the top foods, the top five foods, where I get about 80% of my daily saturated fat intake comes from coconut butter. So it's, it's listed as coconut mana. That's coconut butter, not coconut oil. So that's the whole food. Uh, full fat mozzarella cheese. Uh, it says uh, stony field yogurt, which is uh, full fat plain yogurt, sardines, cocoa beans, which I may use to make my own chocolate, 
And then uh, we see coconut, coconut butter again, but that's because I was logging it using a different name, but it's uh, also coconut butter. So, uh, so of these five foods, which is significantly correlated with glucose? And that's what's shown here. So these are correlations for these five saturated fat containing foods versus glucose over the past three plus year period and including data for 17 blood tests. So of these five foods, the only one that's significantly correlated with uh, fasting levels of glucose is my intake of full fat yogurt. So with that in mind, uh, and I started to see this trend late last year, I removed the full fat yogurt and replaced it with low fat yogurt. And now we can see that the correlation for low fat yogurt is not significantly correlated with glucose. And my glucose levels since late 2020 are still greater than 90. So something else is still driving this effect. And with that in mind, which other dietary factors may be impacting glucose? So one of those factors may be B12, vitamin B12. So I've been supplementing with vitamin B12 for a while now, and we can see here the plot for my B12 levels, uh, dietary B12 levels versus fasting glucose. And we can see that there's a significantly positive correlation, meaning the higher my B12 levels, the higher fasting glucose, or at least the correlation. Now, the reason I've been taking uh, methyl B12, actually not B12, is to limit homocysteine. And for me, my homocysteine levels uh, have been uh, trending higher and they increase during aging and relatively higher levels of homocysteine are uh, associated with the increased all-cause mortality risk. So that's why I've had B12 in my approach. And we can see that correlation here for B12 with homocysteine. The higher my B12 levels, the lower uh, that my homocysteine, my blood levels of homocysteine are. And again, this is also a significant correlation. So if I remove B12, it may reduce glucose if correlation is causing that in this case for B12 with glucose but it may make homocysteine worse. So um, what's the big picture though for B12 on other biomarkers? I don't just wanna affect two, I wanna look at as much of the system as possible to actually see if it will be a net beneficial, neutral or detrimental effect. So for that, I've compiled a composite of biomarkers for multiple organ systems, including kidney function, liver function, lipoproteins, immune cells, red blood cell related, RBC related, uh, inflammation, and the overall biological age score. So these are correlations between my average dietary, uh, uh, daily dietary B12 intake versus all of these biomarkers uh, over the past six years. So 30 blood tests or up to 30 blood tests. I've got how many blood tests with the little N next to each biomarker. So first we can see that a relatively higher B12 intake aside from the glucose and homocysteine story is associated with three biomarkers going in the right direction. So uh, higher B12 is correlated with lower AST, the liver enzyme aspartate aminotransferase, which is good news because relatively higher levels of AST are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. It's uh, B high, relatively higher levels of B12 are correlated with higher platelets and higher red blood cells, which are, is also important because both of those decrease during aging. Now, in contrast, relatively higher levels of B12, dietary B12 in my data, are correlated with higher neutrophils, which is going in the wrong direction. They increase during aging and relatively higher levels of neutrophils are also associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, but then a lower lymphocyte percentage and also that, uh, that biomarker decreases during aging, so that's going in the wrong direction. So the net effect, the net cor correlative effect of B12 supplementation looks like there are four biomarkers going in the right direction, including homocysteine, AST, platelets, and red blood cells, and three going in the wrong direction, including glucose, neutrophils, and the percentage of lymphocytes. So in sum, that seems to be a net plus one. So it suggests a small but positive beneficial effect on the net of my all these biomarkers. So that suggests that I shouldn't take it out. Now, knowing that uh, this net one plus one score for B12 on these 20 biomarkers, what if I make another dietary change uh, to lessen any potential negative effects of B12 removal while still attempting to gain any potential glucose lowering effects of reducing this excess B12 that I was taking in. So what would I change? Now, interestingly, I see a correlation, a significant correlation for my average daily omega-6 fat intake. And notice I don't eat seed oils. This isn't, this is from Whole Foods. Uh, I usually get my omega-6 from walnuts, pecans, and other nuts and or seeds. So the higher my omega-6 intake, average daily omega-6 intake, we can see that the higher my homocysteine levels. And again, this is a co significant correlation as indicated there. Now, if I remove B12 supplementation and limit omega-6 intake to the lower end of my range, somewhere around six grams per day, as opposed to the higher end of my range, which you can see is somewhere around 25 grams per day, it's possible that I can reduce glucose while not increasing homocysteine. But it, as an important part of that story, we need to know that correlation for omega-6 intake with glucose, and then also 
what's the big picture effect of removing or limiting omega-6 on the rest of my biomarkers? So that's what we can see here. And first, starting with the correlation for omega-6 with glucose, we can see that they are not sig significantly correlated, which is good news. If I reduce B12 and limit omega-6 to somewhere around six to, six to seven grams per day, it's possible I can reduce my blood glucose levels. But what about the big picture? So first, relatively higher levels of uh, omega-6 are correlated with a lower VLDL, which is good news because uh, VLDL also increases during aging and relatively higher levels of that are associated with increased cardiovascular disease risk and the incidence of atherosclerosis. So we wanna keep that relatively low during aging. But then conversely, relatively higher levels of omega-6 are correlated with four biomarkers, four additional biomarkers going in the wrong direction. So higher AST, wrong direction again, uh, lower platelets, again, platelets decline during aging, so we don't want them to go in that direction. And then lower red blood cells, but a higher MCV, which again, are both going in the wrong direction. So the net correlative effect of a higher omega-6 intake in my data is five biomarkers going in the wrong direction, including homocysteine, AST, platelets, red blood cells, and MCV, and only one going in the right direction, VLDL. So the net score there would be negative four. So that suggests that I should limit my omega-6 uh, intake. Not eliminate, but limit it. So then when considering the B12 supplementation correlations and the minimizing omega-6 uh, correlations, if I remo remove the B12 and limit my omega-6, that suggests that the overall effect on my biomarkers may be a net positive score of plus three, including reduced glucose. So that's my plan until the next blood test. So stay tuned uh, in at least in another month or so for that data. All right, if you're interested in more info for uh, this approach and my attempts to biohack aging, come join us on Patreon. And uh, that's all I've got for now. If you made it to the end, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.